Oh, isn't Swansea nice when the tide's in and the sun's out? It does happen. It's very, very pretty. Lovely cycling across that front there. Okay, so today I'm um, not so much using this guy as much as using this model here. Um, we've been talking about the heart this week with some students and we were looking at the processes, we were looking at hearts and many people know about the hole in the heart and the hole in the heart babies but they're a little bit confused as to what the hole in the heart when it's a problem after birth is and we were looking at various um, embryological structures and linking them to the add-on. There's a bit of bit hit and miss as to what people knew so I thought hey I could talk about the fetal adaptations of the heart for the fetal circuitry system because it doesn't really use the lungs much and then what we see in the adult heart as a result of those fetal adaptations changing after birth. Sound like fun? I'm squeezing in a bit of embryology right? <laughs> So this is an adult model, but I've already taken the lungs out. So if I just pop off the thoracic wall, I'll take the abdomen off as well. And put the neck, the head and neck back on. And the reason I've taken the lungs out is because I want to talk about the circuitry system as a whole. Um, because in the fetus, before birth, the lungs are developing, and they develop fairly late, or they, they keep developing very, very late, and we know that's an important issue with um, babies that are born prematurely, um, and then they continue to develop after birth. But within the uterus, the fetus isn't using the lungs for gaseous exchange. We have loads of blood going into and in and out of our lungs because we're using our lungs as an organ of gaseous exchange. So uh, the, the blood isn't supplying the lung tissue, the blood is there so the gases can move in and out. So in the fetus, the lungs are developing and the pulmonary arteries, the smooth muscle in there is contracted which is limiting the amount of blood that goes into the lungs because you just don't need that much blood going into the lungs as a fetus and that changes after birth with the first breath but what this means is that of course I don't remember why I had this on there the, the blood from the placenta is coming in here all right so you got that the blood from the placenta is rich in oxygen, rich in nutrients, and it's coming in, into the umbilical cord, and then it's gonna run up and enter into the inferior vena cava under here. Now what the fetus wants to do is to get that nutrient-rich, oxygen-rich blood to the parts of the body that need it for growth. So particularly the, the brain, particularly going up there to the brain, and the head and neck, and then the aorta and off around the body. So we see a number of adaptations in the heart which instead of sending that blood out to the lungs, sends it into the aorta, all right? So the adaptation I think most people know about, right, so this is the anterior heart, so this is the, the right atrium, that's the oracle there, the right atrium's over here, the left atrium's back here. What most people are aware of are that if you open up the right atrium, we can see, you can just about see in there, that there, that is in the adult, that's the fossa ovalis, the oval fossa. And in the fetus, of course, that's a flap valve between the right atrium and if we open up the other side, there it is there, the left atrium. So what's happening here? Well, we've got this lovely blood from the placenta coming up through the inferior vena cava. And then this means that if we have the, the right chamber and the left chamber, the foramen ovale, as it is in the fetus, is a, is, a, is a flap valve, right, pushing that way. And the blood pressure in the right atrium is higher than the blood pressure in the left atrium. What this means is that as that blood moves into the right atrium, it pushes the flap valve of the foramen ovale open and blood flows through from right to left. So by flowing directly from the right atrium into the left atrium, it means it doesn't go into the right ventricle and up the pulmonary trunk and out to the lungs. So most of this blood coming in to the right atrium can just miss all that and go uh, straight into the left side of the heart, left atrium, left ventricle, then up through the aorta and off around the body. Um, now what happens with the first breath? So when you're born, when you're squeezed through the birth canal, all the fluid from your lungs is squeezed out and you take that first breath and the lungs fill with air. 
suddenly that oxygen in the local environment of the lungs triggers the smooth muscle in the arterioles and arteries of the lungs to relax, blood rushes into the lungs, the lung becomes the organ of gaseous exchange, um, and that means that then if a lot of blood is going into the lungs, then a lot of blood comes out of the lungs into the left atrium. So, we're disconnected from the placenta at this point, so if we have our right atrium and our left atrium again, and our flap valve, the pressure in the right atrium is gonna drop, and the pressure in the left atrium is gonna increase because of all that extra blood coming back from the lungs, which means this flap valve, which was letting blood pass from the right atrium to the left atrium, is pushed shut by the increase in pressure on the left side over the right side. So the foramen ovale becomes the fossa ovalis, and that, edge tends to seal in the days or weeks after birth, but in one out of four of us, it doesn't. In one out of four of us, we have um, a patent foramen ovale, so that flat valve never closes and you could open it again. So if you change the pressure in your chest, maybe by coughing or sneezing or um, deep sea diving, things like that, it's possible that you could increase the pressure in your right atrium over your left atrium and push that flat valve open. For most of us, through most of our lives, it's not an issue because the pressure in the left atrium is higher than the pressure in the right, so that valve stays closed, so there's no problem, no symptoms, no nothing, it's all good. It doesn't matter. Um, but apparently there is a slightly increased risk if you wanted to go deep sea diving where the pressures change. And of course there's a risk of developing nitrogen bubbles. And while that's a risk in itself, if you have a, a, a patent foramen ovale, there's a greater risk that those bubbles could go from the right atrium to the left atrium, whoop, um, instead of going to the lungs, they go up the aorta, uh, up the common carotid arteries into the, into the brain, which is way dangerous, right? Um, so in the adult heart then we see that fossa ovalis, um, but that's not the hole in the heart that we talk about when we talk about hole in the heart babies. This whole wall here, this, this whole division between the right and the left atrium, if that doesn't form properly, then that's going to leave a hole. And that's a, an atrial septal defect. And that's a problem because that will allow blood to pass from the right side to the left side after birth, which is not good. The other hole in the heart, by the way, is if this is the left ventricle and this is the right ventricle, the interventricular septum here, it forms by growing up from the base of the heart, but it's also finished off by a bit that grows down from the top here. And if that doesn't form properly, then that'll leave a hole in the heart and that would be a ventricular septal defect, right? So a hole in the heart baby might not, it's probably not suffering from a patent foramen ovale, it's probably suffering from either an atrial septal defect or a ventricular septal defect. So the other thing in here is, can you notice the the curves and the shapes here. This isn't just a simple chamber inside the right atrium. There's curves and spirals and some of the surface of the inner wall of the atrium is smooth and some of it is ribbed and trabeculae like Now what's going on here is that the rough portion has got papillary muscles within it and the smooth, muscle, the smooth parts do not. But this curve here, this is... Um, so we have this, this edge, this curved edge between the rough area and the smooth area, and that's the crista terminalis, certainly in this part here. But the shape here that's formed in here, this gets called the eustachian valve, and it's not really a true valve. What it's doing is it's, it's forcing the flow of blood as it comes up through the inferior vena cava through the foramen ovale. So it forces the blood from the right to the left side of the heart. This isn't a passive thing where the blood flows into the inferior vena cava into the right atrium and then passively flows across from the right atrium to the left atrium through the foramen ovale. No, the eustachian valve, this, this shape in here, is actively directing much of the blood from the right side to the left side. Some of the blood will still go into the right atrium and then into the the right ventricle, but much of that is going to be the blood that's coming down from the superior vena cava. Okay, so that's the foramen ovale, but that's not the only adaptation we see here. If I put this back together, we can see, right, there's the right ventricle, there's the left ventricle, there's the pulmonary trunk, and there's the aortic arch. Now look, you can see between the aortic arch and the pulmonary trunk up here, we have this structure. And this is connecting the two. Does it look any different than this guy? 
If I take this other heart out, look, you can see that. You can see that again there. So that, that join between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta means that. So in the fetus, this is the ductus arteriosus. In the adult, we see the ligamentum arteriosum, kind of this, uh, the remnant of it. But in the fetus, it's another arterial, it's another muscular tube, and it means that blood flowing up the pulmonary trunk, which normally would go out to the lungs, instead can flow up and straight through the ductus arteriosus into the aorta. Once it's into the aorta, it can then flow off around the body. So the ductus arteriosus is another way that blood can avoid going into the lungs and instead goes into the in the aorta and off around the body. Now again at birth, when we take that first breath and we, the lungs see all this oxygen and suddenly the blood that's coming back into the left ventricle is very, very highly oxygenated and what have you, the, um, the cells, the smooth muscle in this case, um, I think it's mediated by prostaglandins, causes the smooth muscle in the muscle in the uh, arterial wall to contract, contract and constrict that, that blood vessel. So that shunt is, is closed off. So the link between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta is closed off. And then it becomes the ligamentum arteriosum closing up a few days and weeks after birth. Sometimes that doesn't happen. And we see a patent ductus arteriosus continuing to link those two blood vessels, which means that blood that's flowing up the aorta will then flow in the opposite direction and back into the pulmonary trunk. So we get a mixing of well oxygenated and poorly oxygenated blood, which can give a number of symptoms that you might be able to work out. But I'm not going to talk about those because I'm just doing an anatomy video, right? So those are the, the two or three adaptations that we see in the heart. The foramen ovale, and the ductus arteriosus, and also that eustachian valve helping blood flow up the inferior vena cava and across from the right atrium to the left atrium. There is also a ductus venosus, which is allowing about half of the blood that passes from the placenta, instead of going through the liver, it kind of bypasses the liver to get to the inferior vena cava. That's down here somewhere. But the other important fact I wanted to point out is that what we're doing is we're sending this oxygen-rich, nutrient-rich blood from the placenta um, across to the left side, ac across to the aorta. But of course, don't forget that not only is it passing around the aorta and around the body, but we have, as we saw in the last video, um, the common carotid arteries up here. So that oxygen-rich blood is getting preferentially pushed towards the brain, which is requiring a huge amount of energy when it's developing um, in the uterus, in the fetus, right? So that's the flow here, imagine that. So there you go. Those are the two main fetal adaptations to the heart that we see remnants of in the adult anatomy that enabled the fetus to avoid sending too much blood to the lungs and instead preferentially send all that oxygen-rich, nutrient-rich blood to the brain and the other parts of the body that needed it. Foreign ovale, ductus arteriosus, um, and that eustachian valve. Um, <clears throat> Eustachio, he was a, a fella from the 1500s, did an awful lot of very accurate, very detailed anatomical work, which I don't think anybody really saw for a couple of hundred years. Anyway, I think he's only got his name appended to a couple of other things. He's got the Eustachian tube in the ear as well, hasn't he? But I think he probably described and drew a huge number of other structures, which other people then discovered for themselves and then discovered that he discovered it, if you see what I mean. But cool guy, go read about him. Okay, well I found that interesting. I love to squeeze a bit of embryology into adult anatomy. <laughs> Don't know if I can always do that. Um, Alright, see you next time. Better find your lungs and put them back, haven't we? <laughs>